This is actually in conjunction with Olle de Moer. He's based in Tilburg in the Netherlands, and his business is our, our research both is in the field of community informatics, which means information systems in service of communities and not the other way around. You know, let's, the servant is the machine. We are not the servants, right? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about alternative approaches towards the goal of sustainable development. I'll later say what that is or what I think it is. But if you talk about sense making and communities, what you're focusing on is local intelligence for local problems and getting local collaboration going so you have a basis for development in your community. And then if you talk about uh, my own research specifically is about individual sense making, about personal support networks, or if you want to be French, Bordeaux, and you call it social capital, um, it's part of the capital's approach to development. So we've got natural capital, the resources, the water, We've got social capital, which is the people we know, the relationships, which is the norms and the culture and so on, of society as well. And you've got financial capital, so there are more than one capital. And then I'd like to talk very quickly about uh, three projects on which we actually try to get sustainability going. You start a project, you get money from government for three years, and then what happens to the project? It dies. So most development projects die. So I'm very glad that you are a resilient community. I looked at resilience for a long time and sustainability, so uh, I can bore you to tears about both of them. Um, right, so we're looking at projects and then um, looking at some current work. I'm going to move at quite a rate, but sense making is something about the old story. If you, you, your data is a number, information is a context added to a number, you're doing 80 kilometers an hour in a 60 zones, so you'll get fined. Knowledge, well, Knowledge is also something about making sense of something in interactions with others to enable action. So knowledge is constructed in conversation as well and not just written down on paper. And I'd prefer not to talk about wisdom and so I'd rather prefer about sense making. Okay, so there's Aldo, his own bright shiny self on the top right hand side. Um, he's consulting companies called Community Sense. So Aldo has been doing a lot of work around what is it to be a community? So, definitions, sense making is the process by which people give meaning to experience, okay? So we are making sense today here of the project, the closure, the way forward. So it's the sense making process. It's a collaborative process of creating shared awareness and understanding out of different perspectives and interests of stakeholders. It does not mean we are agreeing, okay? So it's not consensus, it's sense making. And the core communal activity that we're working on is community mapping geographical knowledge, social network analysis. The benefits of participatory community mapping is the community itself makes sense of its own current state and we're using maps to inform active community building methods using a tool called Kumo, which I'll show a little bit later. So in a participatory cycle, you've got community sense making, which issues priorities to do's, which builds the community to then define interventions and then you can monitor the interventions and feed that into community mapping. So you're creating an artifact, a lot of design science research, you have something tangible, and then you feed that back into your community sense making process. And ideally this is done by the community itself. So we create the architecture, we, we um, introduce them to the processes, uh, but they maintain it themselves. So you're visualizing a network of interactions, you identify focus interactions, you select the context of focus interactions, you design community building interventions. It's grounded in the communities of practice literature, Etienne Wenger et al. and Nancy White, whom I've had the pleasure to meet. And you can also monitor and evaluate the community, gap analysis, goals, action participants, and then you can mix quantitative and qualitative indicators as well. So, Kumu is a web-based tool. I'd like to introduce, to, to introduce it to you. It's free to use it for a private map that the whole world can see. So, uh, really experiment with it and let me know. So, we can also create the Kumu community. I'd, I'd <laughs> and so, you have views and you have the ability to do storytelling. It's shareable and embeddable and I'll show you some applications. In this case, this is the Tilburg urban farming community. People farm at their houses. They farm and little plots, 
artichokes specialist farming and then you've got big commercial farmers so you've got a various amount of people farming this link gets you to the uh, Tilburg uh, public map so you can see what it looks like and uh, if you f zoom in you will get to a point where you can look at uh, the perspective from a specific focus point so what are the connections that this particular uh, NGO has and you also, at, you can see, you can do all your social network analysis calculations as well. Um, anything from between us to degree, whatever, you know, there's about, I think, a basic set of 15 SNA um, things. What's interesting, because it's interactive, people start to compete. And so, look, we actually know more people than you do. And so, there's a healthy element of competition to show you importance in the bigger network. Now, if we look at the context in South Africa, um, the usage of participatory community mapping. In our context, we've got the issue of rural development and a whole range of solutions to it that's not working. Strategic coordination and alignment is the big problem. Uh, could anybody have a guess how many government departments in South Africa is responsible for rural development or has something to say about rural development or ha have a guess? Any number from zero to about 55? How many government departments do we have? No, we have the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform. Okay, that's number one. It's 16, one six. So just imagine trying to coordinate that. So um, what we're trying to do is, uh, I spent five weeks of my life at uh, what they call a hurry up strategy session or a Pakisa in the lovely suburb of Boxburg, uh, trying to work with rural development to come up with um, mapping. And it's still in the plan, so please, uh, if you're religious, pray with me, or if not, just have good thoughts in the line that it remains in the plan and we can actually do this. Because uh, I'd like to create a social network for monitoring the progress of rural development at the community level and building local support structures. Lots of plans and strategies are implemented, but in such a way that we've seen schools that are equipped with five VSATs, five VSATs, and not one of them work. Because the contract is, deploy them, you test them once, you sign them off, and that's it. From five different sources, a lot of them donors as well. So provinces e and doesn't have a view on the development uh, footprint of NGOs, of government, and of other donors, and of the different departments. In the EU, uh, Aldo has been doing a lot of work with Innovation Network, and the Cities Network, the EU, you can look at the Boost Inno Network, is that participatory community mapping is an integral part of a social innovation methodology. We used to talk about living labs like Amsterdam, Leiden, Helsinki, and this whole thing of citizen participation in the, in the city and its future. So if you look at Morocco, I um, just want to skim through the bits in red. Researching, developing, and demonstrating ICT technologies and solutions at scale in real-world settings. So that's where I fit in, okay? Again, if you look at the whole National Development Plan, uh, where I've worked on, Ajay is around, not around. Ajay was one of my colleagues in Broadband for All, IC for Rural Education, IST Hubs for Deep Rural Access. In all of these, we're talking about deployments with more than 200 sites. So there are large rural deployments of ICT that's supposed to have some benefit to people. Now, I've talked about living labs. This is Coffin Barber in Eastern Cape. This is tablets in the hands of teachers of learners of the Eastern Cape. Um, Stakeholder immersion, entrepreneur development. The whole problem is uptake and adoption. For people to usefully use ICTs is a long road, which normally means somebody needs to take your hand and walk with you, or you can work as a group. So if you want to go far, go as a group. If you want to go fast, go alone. Um, I especially focused on uh, entrepreneur development, but there's also health issues. And broadband for all is the focus of the entrepreneur development because the problem is how do you support ICT services in remote rural areas where you only have mobile access. And as we know, mobile data is quite expensive. So we built ICT hubs. Um, this is a little container made out of steel, quite robust. And there's a wireless mesh antenna. And ultimately, they're connected to VSAT. So you can put them down anywhere. They're solar powered. They've got backup power. Uh, and they basically last forever, and we can remotely monitor both the condition of the VSAT plus what's going on inside. 
Inside is based on Linux. Uh, we have a big virus problem, so we keep Windows far away from rural implementations. Because it, it'll, it'll only be there for a week, and then everything will be full of viruses. Okay, so if we look at that deployment, um, 176 schools with the village operator model, which is in Kangala, which is uh, just north of us in the province of Mpumalanga. I took a little bit about digital doorways and then I see in rural schools, but very quickly. We lack connectivity. We've got 17,000 rural schools that are badly connected or just connected via cell phone access. Uh, there's a lack of maintenance. So the village operator is trying to get local support, local people to become the technical support, but also to become the user support person that gets you from uh, access to valuable use and then become sustainable. So in Kangala, we are now in this spot here, Pretoria. So the furthest point is about 150 kilometers that way. So it's northeast or towards the direction of the Kruger National Park, if that is where you want to go. And under 60,000 people live there. There's 14 clusters of schools. Uh, a cluster was basically designed so that you can travel with a taxi for a certain amount of money. Because you're looking after a cluster of schools, there's wireless mesh networks, which is also technological development, wireless backbone, etc., etc. In a cluster, uh, you would see there's a village, off, village operator office, and there's uh, the two other indicators are two schools. One's a school, one's a, a district circuit office. And other instances of offices, this is built on communal ground. And so he had to get, uh, this particular village operator had to get permission from the chief to build on this structure. Uh, this is next to home affairs and where people get pensions. So it's a very good location because you have, as with any good uh, shopping mall, there's feet um, past the door. So the research problem is really why, you know, the reasons for failure lie inside the scope of the project, within the community and outside the community. How do you tackle that? And so I started at the bottom with the entrepreneurial model of the person itself and the linkages to the community. And so the social capital, in other words, of this particular um, set of people. Okay, social capital has got the structural component, the network of who knows who. It's also got different uh, functions, uh, bonding, bridging, and linking, which says something about close relationships, important relationships to those in power, that's linking relationships. There's systemic relations between interventions, and if we just unpack it in a simple model, uh, at the micro level, this is you and your family. At the meso level, this is you and your community organizations, as such as your local church or your local municipality. And at the top, we're talking about the provincial government, we talk about the national government. And you can describe it very simply by looking at the structural networks, the norms that hold, and the sanctions. Recently, we had a norm um, question about what happens in your local um, spur restaurant when two parents disagree about what their children do to each other. So there's a certain norm about what's allowed in a public restaurant or not, and I think we can. And then the sanction might be get kicked out of spur for life. Uh, certainly, there was a network. Now we create a lot of pe network of people that would know about this and complain about. It. And next time something happens, I don't know what's going to happen, but anyway, let's see what the new developing norm is. Now, the biggest problem is um, there's a lot of support at the local level. Your parent loves you, so they help you, right? So, where do you, as an entrepreneur, where do you get your first loan from? A member of your family, about 95% of the time. Don't go looking for venture capital if you want 5,000 rands, right? Okay, and at the meso level, you find, um, so what I did was going to village operators in the office and we would do a map on a flip chart using uh, stickets or post-its and we would draw out the relationships. And um, if you look at that, so here's the village operator. Red means money is flowing. Green means knowledge and information, and these are the actors, and then this indicates how important these actors, the influence of these actors on the survival of this entrepreneur. So people referring me to business, people bringing me business, business partners, 
people of which I'm part of their business processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's kind of easy to do. So you can do any rural project in Africa using just a pencil and a sheet of paper, and come back with a rich picture of the relationship network. And after you've done 14 of these, which I did, you can extract patterns of um, behavior. So if you look, at, for example, at this, you find that some people are isolated, and that this is so village operator 15 is quite an important person because otherwise the other people won't be connected. You know that's an example of a bridging link. So the key findings is around the development and use of the social capital in terms of getting access to resources primarily, or to people who know about resources. And then there's a dichotomy of community service with social and commercial entrepreneurship. If I'm a member of the community and I'm poor, I will beg you for internet access, and I can do so for a tenth time. But as I've seen somewhere, somebody's going to tell you, you have to pay sometimes, you know. I'm also a business. <laughs> um, right. And then what was especially interesting was due to the relationship built, so the personal relationship between the customer and the client. It's not like internet cafe where you walk, walk in, you pay your 15 rands, you, you're on the internet for 30 minutes. There's somebody you can ask questions to, they'll do your CV for you, they'll do your e-filing e of your tax returns and so on. And so new innovation processes actually happened where they become part of new business processes that didn't exist before. So that's an aspect of social innovation that I've seen in action. Okay, so I'm a discipline of the school of Max Neff, an avowed disciple. Uh, Self-reliant human scale development. In other words, if we talk about development, we're talking about people. And if I talk about developing you, I need you to talk at a human scale. I can't interact in development sense with the organization. I can only interact with another person or a group of people. So uh, the thinking in South America was to achieve Development, you have to start at the bottom. So the bottom-driven development of networks of relationships around aligned interests, as you have, and then you influence the top-down uh, resources and the development strategies. So there's the definition of sustainable development. And so you need to build these networks of relationships within which the aligned interest is expressed and can be exercised as an, uh, a, a body that can influence the top. Okay. Examples of what an ICT hub looks like. Now, if we, we just did an analysis of the sustainability. We've been doing ICT hubs for about 10 years. And if you look at the research findings, sustainable use, we are good at technical resources and infrastructure. That we can do. Where we're bad at is sustainable use, the social cultural aspects, sustainable operational operations, reliability, the human resources, the site champion, the field manager, the help desk, support and maintenance, right? And we all know that, but yet we continue to deploy according to this model. So this is kind of my, you know, if anybody gives me a proposal, I would just roll this out and say, okay, how do we score in these dimensions? Uh, next week, we're going to talk for two days again to the Eastern Cape Department of Education about their lack of <coughs> adequate structure to support ICT in schools. I'm going to go very quickly through this. This is basically... A lot of projects happening in a rural area where the idea was to put water and sanitation at a school. You know, water effective toilets in rural areas are not a joke. Um, e health, the Science Technology Center, has finally been built, and then the use of ICT. So that's one particular circuit in a Eastern Cape. Now, if you look at sustainability, what we've learned around 6,000 6, learners, 270 teachers, 50 district officials is we've studied this system, and the best explanation I could come up is the iceberg of ICT4D. So we see the problem, low pass rates, lack of skilled teachers. We see the solution. It's just internet, cell phones, smart boards, tablets. We transmit videos by satellite. What we don't see, and obviously the press likes it, you know, tablets that do their job. It's never people that do the job. The technology saved us, you know. Um, so, the diagnosis has been in the ICT for Development research literature that there's a design actuality gap. Technology is the amplifier of human intent. If there's no human intent, the amplification is zero. You can put a supercomputer down, but no human intent equals zero. And then the low capacity of the system itself to adapt and sustain benefit. So, don't throw a big rock into a small pond or a small rock into a big pond. 
it's kind of matched the size of the rock, the intervention that you're throwing into the pond or the system. So the design context, we designed at university and the context of use is kind of different. Uh, Kentaro spent a good time uh, in, in India. Uh, he started Microsoft Research in India with another person. So the geek heresy is, you know, technology uh, will scale, but it won't. Talk about support, the capacity of that system. If you deploy tablets in schools, you've got one IT tech per district, one per 300 schools. Imagine if we had CSR or in your university, you have 300 schools with 30 personnel, so that's about 9,000 9, people, and you've got one IT tech running around supporting you. Would you love that uh, service? Would it work for you? Doesn't, right. But that's the way they design it, and they've been budgeting like that for 15 years. If we then scale up with tablets, then we just make that worse by a ratio of 200 plus, okay? So on the side of, I might stop here, <laughs> depending on the time, I can show you a few pictures, but designing for sustainability is what we've been doing. Uh, developing implementation, you, you need to develop your implementation scenario to fit the context, in other words, the rock should fit the size of the pool or the problem. And then you need to develop the capacity of the system to sustain change. Systems are afraid of change, bureaucracies even more so. So you need to intervene in that level. And then users as the co-designer of solutions and so on. So, modular design seems to be one particular example just of saying, here's a full implementation, here's the limited implementation, so go modular right from the start. So think about what's needed, what's not. The other thing is the need to match the environment. So you look at the readiness or the capacity for uptake, the institutional readiness, the community readiness, and the project alignment. And then you go through a few cycles before you actually start digging and spending money. You've got dimensions of sustainability. Okay, current work. So improve the usefulness and sustainability of ICT hubs is from now on, as soon as a champion or ICT hub is deployed, they're still being deployed, the trading of an ICT champion to actually create a social map of the NGOs and other schools that support each other in the small remote town. So building a local map. And then we've got deployed we've got deployed hubs that aren't used. I'm talking to the people from the Northwest, you know, so please, Northwest University, um, help help us to help you. Um, I, I told the Dean that about three weeks ago, Dean Fricky, I can't remember his surname, but they're all into innovation and technology engineering and stuff like that. But where's the people side? Okay, so we're going to deploy ICT in 24 schools all over South Africa, and again, we're going to try and improve the sense-making process between the micro-level process in the town between schools, between the school and the Department of Education of the province, and then at the macro level with the actual provincial management who has some control over the budget. Right, so there's, there's our deployment in Northwest. Yellow means VSATs are working and there's ICT app that you can walk into in a remote village and get access to the internet. So that's just the invitation to Northwest. This is some idea of saying let's get local youth and let's take them through a training program. So these are some of the questions we're going to um, help them to, to ask and get answered. And what we're trying to do, I didn't show you Kumu, but Kumu, um, if you look at this kind of structure, um, it tells you that even in something as simple as Morofo, which is a kind of spinach, am I right or wrong, colleagues? Uh, there's a lot of players involved to get small subsistence farmers into commercial value chains. So if you look at the value players there, you find that the interaction between your friends, your fellow farmers, and is fairly rich. There are three, four different types of interaction. If you look at the other interactions, so they're fairly co either purely commercial or purely a gift. So there's a diversity of interactions here. So you build a picture of what happens in the system. So talked about that. We're also eating our own dog food and trying to build an ICT for D research community. I'd like to learn from your experiences in that community. We'd like to equip development implementers to use social mapping to grow social capital in support of sustainability and also improve the evaluation and the shared sense making, the informed decision making. Where is this development going? Where do we see it going? 
and I've had conversations with uh, the chiefs in charge of the CSR, and we're going to give it a try to actually map the influence of the CSR using social mapping tools. We should eat, eat our own dog food before we can advise the government. And we're hoping we get a differed uh, proposal. Differed, after 10 years of effort, recognized that accountability is the chief problem in terms of development funding. Accountability in the system. And you build accountability in the system via people that know each other. You are accountable as a project team because you're working together and you're accountable to each other. You're not really that accountable to any other, in, any other entity. So this is a current picture of the ict for d community in South Africa. Uh, ICT for Agriculture, a few people. We've got lots of people into education, which tells you something about South Africa. Uh, government, not so much, although we do a lot of work in e-government. That's just preliminary... Um, which conferences do people attend? It's trying to give people a sense of community. So where are we going? You know, there's a lot of focus on mobile. There's some focus on mobile. Sykeset is kind of the general computer science IT conference where everybody meets everybody and says hi once a year. And then you've got IST Africa, which covers uh, the whole of Africa. And this is institutions, CSR, UCT, yeah, University of Pretoria. Uh, a fairly small community, and there is the page where this community is exercising itself so let me just move to I'd like just like to show you so this is Kumu live so what I've just shown you this if I put the focus there then the focus is only on that farmer it's a web application and I can have a, I can do a presentation on the basis of that so you can see look at the training departments look at the role of the government department you can see they're playing exactly three roles in the system Okay, so it's very powerful to to make sense. People make it quickly make sense of it. You put all the filters in the world. It's a CSS programming language. You can do whatever you want. Attach attributes to it. Um, for example, our relationship map on the this is now embedded into the South African Development Informatics and ICT4D platform. So I would love to be involved in your operation and let's embed a social mapping exercise within the platform. You know, I'd love, love to help you with that. For free. <laughs> okay, and I think just to conclude, um, I mean, the, the full complexity of it, if one looks at that node, you also have got a website linked to every node. So every institution or every person can have their own personal website, which becomes yours to edit. So that creates, a, 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 I think, a different type of website than the normal one you think, because it's like a collection of uh, many little websites. And then finally, if I've got breath left, I think I'm there. Thanks very much.